Tour of the cell part three. Now we're going to look at the things inside the cell. Yes, the cell structure in very basic terms is interesting. And yes, the cell membrane is obviously a key instrument in this whole process. But the things that are inside of the cell, there's so many, so many interesting ones that uh, it's, it's really exciting to deal with. The first one, the nucleus, of course, is something that we already saw in the first part of this lecture as that large structure that contained the DNA. It dominated the cell, I said. And the reason why I say that is because the nucleus is actually the control center of the cell. A control center. I'm trying to use terminology here that resonates with you. You know what control centers do. For example, air traffic control, that's a control center. Or perhaps the police station is a control center of certain types. So there, there is important information there. The movers and shakers to some degree that make things work or that keep us safe. Those are the kind of things that are the control center. And the nucleus has that capacity because in it, it has information. It has information in genes on the DNA, and we need that information to produce proteins. Around it is a membrane layer. In fact, it's a double membrane called the nuclear envelope. A double membrane called the nuclear envelope. Remember I said something about membranes being a workbench space or a lab bench? Well, it stands to reason that if some of these structures inside the cell have this extra membrane space, that means that membrane space must be very important to be active in how the cell operates. It's the, it's the workbench of the cell where all those reactions can take place. The genetic information inside the nucleus is stored in the form of chromosomes. And of course, as I just mentioned, the chromosomes, that is where we find the DNA. And this information is kept safely inside the nucleus because if it is so important that it gives instructions for your cell to survive and to reproduce and to maintain itself and to operate, then clearly we must maintain the integrity of that information. We don't want any viruses in there. We don't want any glitches to get in. We don't want anything to happen to this fundamentally important program that controls our cell. So that is why it is separated, and that is why it is carefully stored. There's also inside of it the, the little maker of these ribosomes, the things that are important in making proteins, the nucleolus. Nucleolus literally just means little nucleus. It's another uh, small dense kind of area that uh, looks just like a little darkened nucleus. And this is what it looks like. You have in purple here the nuclear envelope and you can see it's a it's a double layer of membrane material. On the inside you have the nucleolus and inside in purple all of this stuff here that's where you'd find the chromosomes, the genetic material. Now clearly, there are ways by which this information can be accessed. There are all kinds of little holes, a little bit like Swiss cheese. Those are nuclear pores. Because just as with your computer, there are ways to access the information on the computer. There are those little USB docks, right? So all those kind of things you need to access the information. So a nuclear pore in this regard is to provide the inside of the nucleus with the nutrients it needs and with the ability of the information to get out to the rest of the cell. So clearly this is a very important part of the cell. If we look at the endomembrane system in general you'll realize that there are outside of the nucleus, a variety of such membrane-bound compartments. Each one of these components of the endomembrane system has in it, uh, has as part of it, these membranes. So wherever you go inside the cell, those, all those organelles, they have a variety of uh, membrane space. 
And just like the cell itself, all these organelles need membranes to function properly. Because the membranes are not outside of the cell, we don't call them cell membrane or plasma membrane, because the inside the cell, we call them endomembrane. And here, endo simply refers to the fact that they're internal. So the endomembrane system and all those things we're going to discuss now, those are actually internal membranes. So they're not there to keep things out or to put things in. They are there because they can be workbench space. Their structure is the same as the big outer cell membrane. They have phospholipids. They can have things embedded in them. They have that fluid mosaic structure. But they are tasked not with keeping things in or keeping things out. They're tasked with work. And that's what they do on the inside of the cell. The first one of these has an awful name, endoplasmic reticulum. What the heck does that mean? Well, the endoplasmic reticulum, endo, we just heard, endo is internal, plasmic, it's internal because it's inside the cytoplasm. So it's a reticulum inside of the plasma. That's what that means. Well, what's a reticulum? A reticulum is kind of like a net or a network. And so if you want to translate that properly, one of the ways by which you can translate this is perhaps to say it's the network inside the cytoplasm. And of course this name comes from a time when people were observing cells for the first time and they were trying to characterize them and they gave them names as best as they could and this is what they thought they saw. They saw some kind of network. Not well defined in their own minds because they didn't know what it was doing, but that's what they saw. And it turns out there are actually two different types. One of them is the rough ER, and the rough ER is characterized by having these little nubbins on it. These little blue nubbins, kind of like studs on leather, right? They are the ribosomes. And so the ribosomes are closely associated with these internal membrane structures here. And this endoplasmic reticulum is very closely associated with the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope is what surrounds the DNA. So if this is how you build a cell, it would make sense to, to suggest that the DNA gets out of this is somehow important to this region and the ribosome must also play an important role. Because if you're going to construct a company or a workflow that works well, you don't want to have one compartment over there and one compartment over here and you always have to cross the entire company to get from one part to the next. You want to build them so that the workflow is able to move very quickly from one room to the next, to the next, to the next, and then out the door. And so, why would it be any different in a cell? Things inside the cell must, to some degree, work efficiently, and so proximity may indicate a function. So again, just coming at this from a scientific observation mindset and asking the question, well, why is this the way we see it? My hypothesis would be, well, maybe they work together. And then you can follow that line of thought. You can, you can check things out. Now, the smooth ER over here does not have the little nubbins, and it is farther afield, farther distance, than the, e, the, the rough ER from the nucleus. So this may be doing something different. Even though it looks similar, because it's still this kind of network, it obviously has some differences. And if you look at this, in a electron micrograph, you can see there is the rough ER, the double layer, 
and all these little black dots those are the ribosomes and here in this cross section there are the bits of the smooth ER as if somebody had taken sort of a, a knife and, and cut right through here so that's what the ER looks like well what does it do what do they do the ribosomes on that membrane surface they are what ultimately gives it the rough appearance and the rough ER actually produces protein precursors so it is involved in the process by which genetic material is used to make proteins therefore clearly it's ideally positioned right next to the nucleus so that works it also produces more membrane the cell is never going to run out of workbench space because the rough ER is going to make more of it the smooth ER which doesn't have these ribosomes produces lipids all kinds of different lipids including hormones so obviously that's also quite important but it has a very different function now once the protein precursor molecules are packaged are made then they can be packaged and they can be transported so here is shown a protein precursor that's what this is that's a protein and you notice you may remember those are all the little amino acids the pearls on a string kind of thing but they're not folded yet they're just literally that necklace a necklace that's just flexible it ha doesn't have a three-dimensional structure yet and one of the things that we talked about in chapter three is that in order to make a fully functional protein you have to turn it into a three-dimensional shape this does not happen in the rough ER in order to do that we need to ship them out and to ship them we use membrane structures called vesicles and that's what this is a vesicle is simply a, a cellular transportation device they are being shipped to something called the Golgi apparatus again another membrane bound organelle and this Golgi apparatus will take those vesicles it will take up the protein precursors and that is where the pro proteins will be properly folded and once they're folded they can be shipped out from the Golgi apparatus so this is a very important organelle because it finishes the proteins it's a little bit like if you think of uh, the automotive industry you have parts and these parts are coming in at the one end of the plant and then they're being assembled and once you have assembled them all what happens well the car is ready to roll out right that's that's basically how you can see the Golgi apparatus work now what do you do with the car well some of the cars are shipped overseas outside the cell some of the cars are domestic so they stay inside the cell but either way this is where your supply of proteins ultimately comes from there are some specialized vehicles if you will that use are used to transport proteins I want to give you a couple of those one of those is a lysosome and a lysosome is formed as a digestive process center a process for digestive uh, functions and so when you're looking at what needs to be digested inside of a cell well obviously food right food needs to be digested so the food comes in here's a food item it comes in and it's moved into the cell and it becomes packaged into something called a food vacuole that's another one of those membrane bound structures and the lysosome here it has digestive enzymes in it and the lysosome with the digestive enzyme meets the food vacuole now here's an interesting thing think about this baby pool back to the baby pool you remember it was ping pong balls if you take an extra bunch of ping pong balls and you load it on top of the baby pool well they'll just be on top of that right and you can sort of put your hands and and put them down and some of them will come back up but it's just more ping pong balls it's still a fluid structure 
And if you then start to expand that baby pool a little bit, those ping pong balls will just form a new layer. They'll just sink in and they'll become part of that layer. And so one of the neat things about having a fluid mosaic is that these two can simply merge into one slightly larger one because everything is fluid everything is dynamic and so out of two individual little organelles you can make one larger one without losing the bits and pieces on the inside so you end up with digestion possible inside of one of these lysosomes they are also used to break down damaged organelles in this case they will simply gobble up the organelle and they will recycle the materials. Plants have storage devices. Animals also have storage devices. Protists have storage devices. And these vacuoles are used uh, for different purposes in protists. Those are single-celled eukaryotic cells and in plants. Uh, in plants you have these central vacuoles and if you look at the dimensions of a central vacuole, you'll see that they form almost all of the cell. So this is all central vacuole. And here's the nucleus. And so in this plant cell, the nucleus is squished to the side. And you may see this in an onion cell or in a potato cell because the potato needs it for starch storage. The onion needs it for water storage so it moves everything else to the side. In contrast, there are actually contractile vacuoles and they contract and expand as they help this organism regulate its water household. Now by way of review, let's take a look one more time at how the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus work together, how they're connected. And so you're looking at this perhaps best as a conveyor belt, just like you know the car industry. So you start out with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Protein precursors are made and they're transported from the ER to the Golgi apparatus. In the Golgi apparatus, the protein precursors are transformed into finished proteins and the finished proteins can be shipped out in so-called secretory vesicles and they can be shipped out to the outside of the cell as I said before that would be an export or you place them inside of vacuoles or lysosomes and then they're domestic products so that's what this endomembrane system does and these parts they always are able to work with each other because these membranes have that fluid dynamic structure, that fluid, mos fluid mosaic structure. Always think baby pool, always think ping pong balls, and I think it'll make it a little bit more palatable. Now overall, the way I like to see this is just literally car manufacturing. Car manufacturing nowadays is a very modern process, and this process is a great analogy. The genes in the nucleus are like the design plans for the car. The RNA is like the data disk. This is the information that you take and the design plans are on it, the particular plan that is needed to implement at the factory. So the manufacturing where the parts are made is going to happen in this case in the endoplasmic reticulum. The vesicles are then the trucks that are shipping the parts to the assembly plant. That's the Golgi apparatus, of course. And at the end, what comes out of the Golgi apparatus, the lysosomes and the secretory vesicles, those are the trucks that are shipping the finished proteins, the finished cars. So you can look at this analogy and hopefully make sense of why this endoplasmic, uh, why this endomembrane system works so well together. Two more organelles, these are important because they are different than the endomembrane system and because they deal with energy. So these are not involved in making proteins for the rest of the cell, these are involved in energy. 
Now they have two layers of membranes. The chloroplasts are particularly interesting because they have these these two layers. So there's one membrane here, then there's the internal an, another internal layer, so inner and outer. And then even here there's more membrane space, more and more membrane space everywhere inside of this chloroplast. Chloroplasts have a huge number of workbench workbenches because they are allowing this chloroplast to capture light as it comes in from the sun and they need a lot of workbench space in order to capture a lot of light and of course they can then convert that to chemical energy so that's what the chloroplast does and we single it out and it's even though it has a membrane around it, it's not part of the endomembrane system because chloroplasts actually have their own DNA that's not human DNA that's chloroplast DNA and that'll be something we'll talk about later very similar to chloroplasts but not able to pick up energy from light are mitochondria mitochondria also have these two membranes they have an outer membrane full outer membrane and an inner membrane they also have these convoluted curves in these membranes and so again there's a huge amount of workbench space that they make available and in both plants and animals they are the places where energy is made this is where the energy comes from that drives the processes in the cell and again they're separated out because they also have their own mitochondrial DNA mitochondrial DNA. That's an interesting thing to contemplate and we'll leave you, I'll leave you with that idea. Why would something that's an integral part of our cell have its own specific DNA that is totally different than our own DNA? And so that's something to contemplate. And that's the end of chapter 4. Thank you.